Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mr. Miller here, and this is a video for Tuesday, uh, the 12th of May, Tuesday, May 12th. Uh, so, yes, you may be noticing I had to I had to get rid of it. It was bothering me so much, so I had to get rid of it, uh, my facial hair. So I still have, you know, I still got some, uh, but most of it I got rid of. So in case you were wondering what the answer to that riddle was, there it is, most of my facial hair. What's there today and gone tomorrow? Um, so, uh, it will grow back, don't worry, it, it happens that way, but yes, I know I made a promise that I would, uh, keep it throughout the quarantine. When I made that promise, I thought we were done in April, uh, with the quarantine, and now it's May 12th, and we were supposed to be back at school for a month at this point, so I would have been able to shave for over a month, so I said, I think I've done my duty with this, and it's driving me nuts, so I'm gonna get rid of it. So, that's what happened. Anyways, uh, we're going to move on today with uh, topic 16 through 18 notes. We are close to being done. We'll finish that up tomorrow uh, with topic 16 through 18 notes. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap that up tomorrow. But for today, we have um, basically some culture stuff in the 1960s and 70s. Okay, what is going on in America's culture through this time period? So let's go ahead and jump right into uh, right into it here. So we have uh, number 17 here, which is the counterculture. Uh, the counterculture shapes America. Now, the counterculture uh, is a, I guess, a, a group or a time period, a movement maybe is the better way to say it, a movement during the 1960s. Uh, the counterculture is a time when uh, younger people in America uh, like people your age and a little bit older, uh, but college-aged, uh, high school and college-aged and shortly thereafter. Uh, a time when those people are uh, kind of questioning the uh, culture, the established culture in America. Uh, and they are advocating for ideas that are opposite of accepted culture. So that's why it's called the counterculture, because it goes counter to what the accepted culture movement was at the time. So. Hopefully that's self-explanatory, the counterculture. Now, the most uh, noteworthy group in the counterculture are pictured in uh, mostly this picture on the, on the left, but also I guess these, these people in the, in the right picture would be uh, considered this as well. Uh, we know them by their nickname, uh, the hippies. So hippies are there on the board in red. Um, so hippies are, who are they? Uh, well, most of the time they were older baby boomers. Uh, they had been born right after the war and as they're coming of age in the 1960s, uh, they are basically starting to experiment with a bunch of things and change around uh, the accepted beliefs in America. So they are experimenting with uh, dress, different ways of dressing themselves, uh, tie-dye clothing and all that stuff. The stereotypical hippie is like a tie-dye clothing uh, sort of thing. Uh, Bell-bottom pants, that sort of that sort of thing too, uh, I guess. Uh, so experimenting with dress and clothes, experimenting with music, uh, so new types of music, rock and roll music is becoming more popular. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, also, relationships, open relationships, um, are kind of more popular at this point among these people. Less people are running out to try to get married, uh, not viewing that as the, that as a thing that people want to do. Uh, more open relationships in general, uh, and then drugs, experimenting experimenting with drugs as well. Uh, from you know kind of lower level drugs like marijuana uh, to higher level drugs like uh, psychedelics and different things like that acid um, lsd those those sorts of drugs so um let me see do i have another picture here i do okay so i want to show you guys uh, i want to at least tell you guys about uh, different musical things that are happening happening at this point. Like I said, the, the hippies were experimenting with new types of music and uh, the most famous musical group of the 1960s are pictured here in, um, pictured here on the left, uh, and they would be the Beatles uh, from England. Uh, so the Beatles come over in uh, 1964, I wanna say, 
uh, early, early to mid-1960s, 63 or 64, I'm pretty sure it was 1964. They come over to America uh, and kind of take America by storm. Uh, they only end up, uh, I guess they break up in like 1970, but they were uh, well known as the best rock and roll band of the day, and most people uh, would count them as one of the best rock, rock and roll, one of the best bands of all time. Uh, the Beatles, you know many of their songs, I'm assuming, uh, and if you don't, go look some of them up, because uh, they're pretty good, I guess. Uh, so the Beatles are there, uh, and they are all, uh, they've all got shaggy hair, they're dressed in costumes at this point, uh, but they have shaggy hair, they've got thick mustaches, that's kind of the, the look that they're, that they're going for. So uh, they didn't always have mustaches, though. When they first came over, they were uh, clean cut with like really shaggy, uh, bowl cut sort of uh, sort of hair styles. So uh, the Beatles, very popular. Uh, there's also a big music festival that happens at the end of the 1960s. It was 1969 that it happened, uh, and it was uh, in New York. It was at a place called Woodstock, uh, or at least uh, it was at a farm downstate uh, that was in the town of Woodstock. Uh, this guy basically said uh, that he would host a music festival on his property or gave some music promoter his property to use. And uh, it turns into a massive music festival. Uh, lots of people were there. Uh, Jimi Hendrix was there. Jimi Hendrix, uh, popular guitarist. Um, I don't know who else was there. I think Bob Dylan was there. Um, so famous people were there. It was, it was the biggest musical festival probably ever, uh, at least the most noteworthy one probably ever, uh, at least in America. So uh, Woodstock Musical Festival, or Music Festival in 1969, they actually tried to recreate it last year. Uh, they were going to do it at Watkins Glen uh, Raceway uh, down in Watkins Glen, just south of us here, south of Ithaca. Uh, but they ended up running into permit issues or something. Uh, they were going to have a lot of bands there, famous bands, but uh, nowadays famous bands, not like bands from back then because most of them aren't alive anymore. Uh, but it kind of fell through, I guess. Uh, they ran into issues with permits or something like that. I'm not sure. Now, let's move on to um, number 18 here. Oh, no, one thing to mention. Uh, I mentioned that they were experimenting with drugs. Hippies were experimenting with drugs in large numbers. Uh, drug overdoses, because drug, uh, you know, drugs aren't good for you to use, okay? Get that DARE symbol on my channel, okay? DARE accepted. Um, but drugs aren't good for you, so people get addicted to them in higher numbers in the 60s, and people die from them in higher numbers in the 60s. So all in all, not good. Okay, just not good stuff here in the 1960s, uh, at least in regards to that. Now, uh, let's talk about number 18 here, number 18. Um, number 18, we're not really going to, I guess a thought that just popped in my head, unrelated kind of to number 18, but if you think about the, the culture that's changing and shifting beneath people's feet, a lot of people at this time, if you're a member of the older generations at this point, you are probably feeling like uh, society is uh, shaking under your feet and everything that's good about society is being destroyed by this younger generation. So there is kind of like a culture war that's going on here. Do we keep the culture that we had or do we kind of transition away from that into something else, uh, into something new? Now. Part of that is uh, the hippies, but also part of that is the feminist movement here in the 1960s and 70s. So the feminist movement to start with. Uh, this is the goal of the feminist movement, I guess we should start with. The goal of the feminist movement is to kind of redefine traditional roles for women, uh, redefine traditional uh, roles for women in America. Also challenge discrimination, make it so that uh, women have a fair, fair shot in society and can do what they want to do. Maybe they want to go to work, that's fine. Uh, they should be able to do that. So before this, it wasn't really accepted though. Uh, so there's, there's very traditional roles that are kind of being challenged here. The most famous uh, person in this, uh, in this whatchamacallit, uh, feminist movement, uh, is pictured here. Her name is Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan. I've got her name listed right there in blue. Uh, Betty Friedan. 
Uh, Betty Friedan is well known for being the leader of uh, a group that we'll talk about in a second, uh, or I guess I'll mention it now. She's, uh, she kind of founded or created what they call the National Organization for Women. National Organization for Women, uh, abbreviated N-O-W, NOW, National Organization for Women. And that was uh, created in the 60s, 66, yeah, 1966 is what I have written down. She is also well known for uh, publishing a uh, book Okay, and the book there is uh, in black here. Uh, it is called The Feminine Mystique. The Feminine Mystique. So The Feminine Mystique, uh, let me explain a little bit about that. Okay, uh, The Feminine Mystique kind of lays out all the goals uh, for, the, uh, for the feminist movement here. Um, it takes a page out of... I'm sorry for the yawn, I apologize. That's number one. So the feminine mystique takes a page out of uh, a book that is well known, uh, kind of notorious in America at this point, called the Communist Manifesto. Uh, the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engel, or yeah, Friedrich Engel. Engel. Um, so Karl Marx is the founder of communism, and that's who, what we remember him for. But uh, the Communist Manifesto, the end of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, the line at the end of the Communist Manifesto is, uh, it says this, quote, uh, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains, meaning that workers are totally oppressed and have to rise up and they won't lose anything. Uh, this is a win-win situation. Either they stay where they're at or they lose their chains and they're now free. Okay, so it's, they can only go up from the bottom, basically. So Betty Friedan sees... Uh, sees kind of this uh, kind of uh, comparison between communism, uh, between the workers in the 1840s and 50s and 60s when, Mar or when uh, communism and Marxism was kind of coming out. Uh, she sees a comparison between those people and women in the 1960s because women are uh, kind of uh, oppressed and held back and not allowed to do what they want to do in society in any large ways. So she takes the last line of the Communist Manifesto, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains, and she changes it. In the end of this book, uh, she, she lays out this whole movement, but at the very end, uh, she parodies a little bit. She says, uh, women of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your vacuum cleaners. Okay, and that is true. Uh, that is true. It sounds kind of funny, but that is what it is. Uh, basically, the vacuum cleaner would have been a, a sign of like a domestic chain, uh, something that was holding women back. Uh, these vacuum cleaners, household duties. So uh, women of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your vacuum cleaners, was what she said. Now, uh, there is also a big movement here in the 1960s uh, and 70s that is advocating for uh, kind of a constitutional change to advocate for equal rights. Uh, we call it the uh, Equal Rights Amendment that is picture or that is written down there, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, we abbreviate it the ERA. So the Equal Rights Amendment would have been, uh, it would have basically guaranteed gender equality in the Constitution. Now, there is nothing in the Constitution that expressly denies gender equality. Uh, there are areas of the Constitution where originally written, uh, it did not guarantee uh, equality between races. Uh, it, it never really said anything about genders, though. Um, it just men were able to vote, but then that was that was changed uh, with the 19th Amendment. Uh, but there's no real distinction between men and women made in the Constitution. So uh, women at this time say, let's go ahead and advocate for a constitutional amendment that will once and for all, uh, once and for all, end any threat of uh, any threat of discrimination based on gender or sex at this point, they're kind of the same thing. So uh, viewed as the same thing. So um, that's kind of the, the purpose of this Equal Rights Amendment. It would have laid out for, uh, for future generations, it'd be a constitutional amendment that would uh, go ahead and guarantee equal rights uh, for genders. 
uh, it never actually gets ratified. It makes it through Congress, but it never actually gets through all the states. Uh, I believe currently it's still in play, like states could vote on it if they wanted to. Uh, they're like, I want to say they're just a handful of states short. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but uh, they would need 38 states to ratify it, and I think they're at like 30-something, mid-30s. So this has been going on since 1973, and most most Americans nowadays, at least opponents to this Equal Rights Amendment, they would say, look, I don't want women to be oppressed. However, I don't really think that this uh, ERA is necessary because there's no discrimination towards women. Uh, so is it necessary or not? That's kind of a question. Uh, this is more of a guarantee. If this was put into place, it would be a guarantee of equal rights. And uh, most opponents to the ERA say they already have equal rights. What 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 more do we want? You know, so uh, I don't know. It's kind of a contentious point. It's not as contentious as it used to be. It was much more of a hot topic uh, a handful of years ago when this was still being discussed as a uh, as a new amendment. Now let us move on to uh, number nineteen. Okay, number nineteen here. Uh, the accomplishments of the women's movement, or the feminist movement, if you will. Uh, there were a couple different laws that were passed, or parts of laws that were passed, that guaranteed rights for women. Uh, one of them was a section of a law that we've already talked about called the Civil Rights Act uh, in 1964. There was a section of the Civil Rights Act that uh, basically banned or outlawed discrimination based on sex. So that is, uh, I guess, a popular thing and a, and a good thing that happened here. So it outlaws discrimination based on sex in the equal or in the Civil Rights Amendment or the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act in 1964. Uh, a more famous uh, accomplishment here uh, is something that is called uh, Title IX. Uh, this is IX. It's Roman numerals for Title IX. I also had Title IX written up here, uh, but Title IX is a little section of a law that was passed in 1972 called the Higher Education Act, uh, the Higher Education Act of 1972, and Title IX is a section of that law. Title IX basically says that uh, women have to have equal opportunities in education. Uh, education cannot be, uh, cannot have discrimination in it based on uh, sex. So you can't discriminate people based on whether or not they're a guy or a girl. Uh, you have to kind of treat everybody equal, and you have to have equal opportunities. Uh, at this point, you would have had, uh, you would have had, basically most. Uh, I well, I don't know if it, at this point, uh, like women's sports in high school and in college, they were coming into popularity. Uh, but women weren't really guaranteed those opportunities. But if you give an opportunity to a guy, you have to give an opportunity to a girl. Um, if you have, and this is this is partly the reason why a lot of sports allow uh, different uh, genders to play in them. Uh, like for example, uh, volleyball. If somebody wanted, if a guy wanted to play volleyball in Moravia, I think they'd probably have to let it happen uh, because there's. Uh, the rule is there has to be a comparable sport, uh, a mostly equivalent sport uh, that that person could play. So you can't have a guy play girls soccer or a girl play guys soccer if there's both programs. Uh, if there's only one program, like when I was going in through high school, there wasn't a girls soccer team. So uh, when I, my senior year, we had girls on our team because there wasn't a girls soccer team. So we had girls on the boys varsity soccer team. Uh, it just was what it was. Um, so, uh, but uh, what was I trying to say? You can't, uh, like, I mean, you can't have a guy play softball or a girl play baseball because uh, at least in New York State, those are considered equivalent sports. I know they're not the same. Don't bite my head off about that, okay? I know that softball is not baseball and I know that baseball is not softball, but they are close. Both of them involve a ball being pitched and a batter and a hit and a baseball glove or a softball glove and a catcher and you know so they're close they're not the same I'm not pretending like they're the same uh, people have like yelled at me about that and I'm like I'm not saying that they're the same but they're close that's all I'm saying 
So Title IX guarantees those opportunities for uh, women specifically, but for uh, both, both uh, guys and girls and any gender under the sun, basically. Uh, also, we have a major Supreme Court case that is uh, handed down in 1973. Uh, and this court case is a very famous one, probably uh, top five or six of all time in America. Uh, and it is called Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. You've undoubtedly heard of Roe v. Wade. Uh, Roe v. Wade is the abortion case. Okay, and I'm, uh, yeah, we at least have to talk about it. We're not going to open up a big debate. In class, we would just talk about this. We wouldn't open it up into a big debate either. Uh, oftentimes, people want to go there. I'm not sure why, because all that ever happens is people yelling at each other. Um, unfortunately, that's how people think they have to debate nowadays in America. Anyways, uh, this abortion conversation, Roe v. Wade legalizes abortions uh, with some state restrictions. States can pass restrictions on abortions, but the right to have an abortion is uh, kind of preserved under Roe v. Wade. So for what it's worth, uh, it still stands today. Uh, it might not stand forever. Who knows? I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it will depend on... Uh, I don't know what happens going forward uh, with the Supreme Court, but uh, you never know. So Roe v. Wade at this point uh, guarantees rights for women to have an abortion. Now, we're going to move on to uh, number 20, which is minority rights and consumer protections. Um, so minority rights and consumer protections. Give me one second. I got to change some things on my whiteboard and I'll be right back. But you won't notice it because it'll be just like boom, boom, paused and then back. Okay, I'm back. I am back. Uh, so, minority rights and consumer protections. We have a guy pictured here. He is a very famous guy in some circles. Uh, his name is uh, Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez. Uh, Cesar Chavez uh, creates a kind of a union for farmers and, well, not farmers, but farm workers, migrant laborers. Uh, it's called the United Farm Workers here in red. So this uh, United Farm Workers, uh, it is basically trying to provide rights in the 1960s to migrant workers, people who were unprotected and people who are often working for low wages and lower wages than, um, I don't know, lower wages than they probably should have been. So yes, migrant workers. Now, uh, there's also another guy here that I got to show you. Uh, this guy pictured here uh, in seated there. Uh, his name is uh, Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. Sorry, my green marker is kind of dying on me and I can't get into school to get another one. It's so sad. I might need to go with three markers. I only brought one of each home. Anyways, uh, Ralph Nader here. Okay, so Ralph Nader writes a book, uh, and his book is titled Unsafe at Any Speed. Uh, any guesses what that's about? Oh, the American automobile is listed there in the subtitles. Uh, the Designed in Dangers of the American Automobile. Uh, Ralph Nader writes this book in 1965 and basically exposes the fact that there are a lot of ways that people can die in a car, specifically. Uh, in accidents that, uh, you know, aren't really, uh, the cars aren't really designed to survive those accidents. Uh, back when cars were created, uh, they would only go uh, 20, 30 miles an hour. Uh, some faster, obviously, but majority of them not. So uh, these cars are going slower. And as these cars are starting to go faster and faster and faster uh, into the 1940s, 50s, 60s, they are not really improving at all in terms of their safety. Uh, there's no seat belts in cars. Imagine that, driving down the highway with no seat belt. That'd be crazy. Um, so this prompts, this book, Unsafe at Any Speed, prompts the government to make a change in terms of creating a government association called the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, yes, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, uh, sets up standards for cars and automobiles, uh, requires seat belts in cars. So that's a popular thing and a, a helpful thing at this point. It's just a safety thing. Also, you get into things like crash testing, things like that. 
Now, do I have another picture here? I don't. Uh, I've got a, one more thing here to mention. There is a uh, government administration that's created at this point too, uh, called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, you probably know them by their abbreviation called OSHA. Uh, if you've ever been in a workplace, you've probably heard about OSHA and how OSHA is going to come shut them down and everybody jokes about that. But OSHA, they go in and inspect workplaces to make sure that people are uh, safe while working there. So it is a kind of a designed uh, effort to keep everybody safe while working. So workplace safety rules are put in place by OSHA. They get kind of a bad rap. Maybe, I don't know, they get, they get a bad rap anyways. So uh, that's all I got for you. So I've got two questions for you guys to answer in those essential questions. So go ahead and do that. Uh, we will wrap up with topic 16 through 18 homework, to, or topic 16 through 18 notes tomorrow. So we'll wrap up there. Uh, so again, go ahead and work on those essential questions. When you're done with that, you're done. Okay, see you tomorrow.